In late December 1694, Queen Mary II, the popular consort of William of Orange, the stadhouder who had become King of England in 1689, took to her bed with a headache. It was very unusual for her as she prided herself on her physical fitness and she would regularly walk the distance between the palaces at Whitehall and Kensington. Spots soon appeared on her long body. She was 180 centimeters tall and her doctors quickly diagnosed measles, a serious enough disease even now. However, they got it wrong. The queen had contracted smallpox. By Christmas day, the fever was raging. Three days later, on the 28th of December, she died at Kensington Palace, childless at the age of 33. The day following her death, her body was embalmed and then removed to Whitehall Palace, where it remained, lying in state for several months until early March 1695, when it was buried with great ceremony in Henry VII's chapel at Westminster Abbey. King William, normally so buttoned up, so withdrawn and emotionless, emotionless was now distraught. He gave himself over entirely to acts of mourning, quote, fainting often and breaking out into the most violent lamentations. And on public business in the weeks that followed his queen's death, it seemed he couldn't stop weeping. He had wanted his queen to be buried privately and without ceremony, but she had been so universally loved that he was reluctantly he reluctantly permitted an elaborate state funeral, one of the most impressive that has ever been accorded an English monarch, one whose expense even then was enormous, 50,000 pounds in 1695, the equivalent of about 15 million euros now. In biting cold and stinging snow, through streets wrapped in black, at the instructions of the state architect, Christopher Wren, Enormous crowds preceded an ornate funeral carriage. And driving the grief of the mourners along within the cortege were five sets of paired trumpeters and, by all accounts, almost 30 drummers playing a sequence of mourning music, including this serene march by Henry Purcell, the king's composer. Purcell's music was also heard inside the Abbey for the funeral service, which was performed by Vox Luminis last weekend. He had written a new setting of Thou Knowest, Lord, the Secret of Our Hearts, a text drawn from the Book of Common Prayer, that miraculous invention of 17th century English theology. By the early 18th century, this setting 
was still being spoken of as a work rapturously fine and solemn and so heavenly in the operation which drew tears from all. Those tears would flow again seven months later when, after a short illness, Purcell himself died at the age of 36. And he too would be buried in the abbey, the ceremony accompanied by the very music he had composed for the queen. If you're interested, his last resting place is in the north aisle of the abbey, at the foot of the organ which he had played in an official capacity for the previous 15 years. A marble tablet erected shortly after his death records that the late lamented composer, that very great master of music, quote, had gone to that blessed place where only his harmony can be exceeded. When we hear such heavenly harmonies, over three centuries later, might we too feel inclined to mourn? But if so, for what? To mourn for the Queen, maybe, whose early death robbed Britain of one of its greatest potential monarchs. Or for Purcell, who died too soon. We can only, alas, imagine him, imagine him living into the early 18th century and meeting Handel in London, perhaps collaborating on an oratorio or two? Or do we mourn the Baroque age itself, which saw, of course, the development of an enlightened intellectual milieu that was the legacy of the European Renaissance, an age which saw an obsession with philosophical debate and scientific experiment leading to the foundations of modern knowledge, an age which sponsored heartily the splendor, beauty, and energy which emerged variously in its literatures, architectures, and music? Or do we now simply mourn early music itself? Mourning, according to Sigmund Freud, is longing for something lost. Mourning, he writes, is, quote, regularly the reaction to the loss of a loved person, or to the loss of some abstraction which has taken the place of one, such as one's country, liberty, an ideal, and so on. Perhaps also, one might add, an aesthetic too might be mourned. In such acts of mourning, in such mournful situations, we expect that temporary condition that Freud calls the normal affect of mourning, the experience of, quote, a painful frame of mind, quote, a loss of interest in the outside world, in other people, in activity, and in love. The withdrawal that we see in mourning, Freud suggests, is due to the energy demanded by what he calls the work of mourning. Mourning is a slow, painful, difficult process, but it has to happen. It is a means of not hanging on to the dead body of the past, but letting it go so that we might move on. Culturally, where does this leave the early music movement, whose repertory has always been that which exists prior to the common practice canonical music of the concert hall? The chamber music concert, the opera house, those forbidding institutions of the classical tradition, where does this leave a movement which has sought to understand the contexts in which that older music that for so long seemed so odd was not only perfectly normal in its time, but also heavenly? Where does this leave a movement whose existence is grounded in the idea of spontaneity, of excitement, of recapturing experiences otherwise lost to us, in the idea of reviving music that has not been heard for centuries by recapturing performing styles, including improvisation, ornamentation, and other intuitive effects that have, alas, been lost in modern performers' tuition? a tuition which leads them towards the exact reproduction of the notes on the score. Where does this leave a movement founded on the notion that lost practices and broken traditions can be recovered through research and academic practice? Well, it perhaps leaves it unmourned. For in bringing it back to life, the risk is run that early music is never freed on its own terms. Perhaps it needs to be let go, to be mourned, so that it can return more vividly still and in new forms. <laughs>
Many of you will have heard Purcell's music, the piece that we heard a few minutes ago, first in a concert hall, such as this splendid building, or even, one might venture, in the Purcell Room on London's South Bank Centre. But I should imagine that there also will be a proportion of this audience who's, for whose first encounter of Purcell was, uh, whose first encounter of Purcell's music for Queen Mary's funeral will have been, well, more cinematic. In 1971, Stanley Kubrick released his filmed adaptation of Anthony Burgess's dystopian novel of youth revolt, A Clockwork Orange, a fiction in which the effective powers of classical music are extraordinarily represented. Seeking to, 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 to depict those powers still more cinematically, Kubrick commissioned a composer known then as Walter Carlos, but known now as Wendy Carlos, um, having uh, changed sex sometime in the 1970s. Um, Walter Carlos, who had hit the number one slot on the Billboard classical music charts in 1968 with Switched On Back, she, uh, he commissioned Walter Wendy Carlos to craft eerie electronic versions of those classical masterpieces that he, Kubrick, had chosen to accompany the film's often shocking images. The most infamous of which, of course, is that reworking of Purcell's March. Carlos had initially tried to convince Stanley Kubrick not to use this piece, as the director could not find an early music recording that suited the perverse style of his film. But Kubrick was adamant that the harmonies of Purcell should form a background. And so he commissioned a new version, a new version, an electronic version that we have just heard. It's hev the heavenly chords of Purcell now sounding as frigid as iced water dripping from a burst lead pipe. The march launches the film, and after a garishly coloured opening credit sequence, the camera closes in on Alex, 
the chief thug of the Droogs, who looks out from under his bowler hat, surrounded by his gang at the Corova Milk Bar. And then it returns in a variety of scenes as a kind of leitmotif through the film, an anthem for ultraviolence. Carlos later observed, quote, the Purcell is transmogrified into something more spacey, electronic, weird, and it worked. Stanley liked it very much, and he never looked back. Well, oddly enough, I think that Purcell, too, would have endorsed this, this refusal to look back. Because only a few weeks after the Queen's death, in the spring, the late spring of, 15, uh, of 1695, his funeral march emerged as incidental music for a play entitled The Libertine. The Libertine was a version of the Don John, the Don Juan legend, by a dramatist called Thomas Shadwell. A very prolific writer he was, and a very controversial writer. This play had been first performed in 1676, but it was revived in the late spring of 1695. Over the previous 20 years, this play had gained the same reputation for sex and violence that Clockwork Orange gained three centuries later. It features about 30 murders, about 10 of which take place on stage. There are half a dozen fights, and more than a dozen women are either seduced or raped in the course of the play, including several nuns. Purcell's morning music is heard at the beginning of the last act, and it introduces a midnight feast at a tomb where the ghosts of all Don Juan's victims are assembled, and where instead of wine, there is only blood to drink, served up by a choir of devils. At the climax of the scene, accompanied by thunder and lightning, Don John sinks down with the devils in a cloud of fire and leaves behind a puff of infernal smoke, mourned by the music and gone for good. Thank God. Now, obviously, no treasonable slur against the dead queen was intended by Purcell. Her late majesty was not, by implication or association, notoriously licentious or, God forbid, hell-bent. But only the shock and awe, the momentous sense of finality, was constant in both performances and perhaps in Kubrick's version two the perfect fit of the notes and instruments to the work of mourning. But now that music, that music too, once mourned and its harmonies exceeded, could be heard, free and easy, free to move once more across time and space and across form. Thank you. <laughs>